In this episode of Think Stupid Simple, we're talking to one of my closest friends, Lee Morris. Now, Lee is the co-founder of a website called fstoppers.com. And originally, Lee and his partner, Patrick, started fstoppers as simply a place to kind of post videos and kind of education that they themselves were seeking at the time. Now, if you are a photographer or creative professional of really any capacity, it is very likely that you've heard of fstoppers because today the site generates three to five million unique visitors per month. Their accompanying YouTube channel has almost a million subscribers and fstoppers quickly became a full-time business for both Lee and Patrick. Today they live in Puerto Rico. They generate content and create professional education for aspiring photographers, cinematographers, and other creative pros. And in this episode, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things, including Lee's experience in starting F-Stoppers, what it's like working with your closest friend and business partner. We'll talk conflict resolution, business, all of the above. Let's go ahead and dive in. This is the TSS Podcast. It's a place for authentic conversations to uncover the stupid simple truths that help us succeed and find happiness. Welcome to Think Stupid Simple. Those that are tuning in, um, this is the other half of fstoppers.com. But Lee is so much more than just f That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm a lot more than Patrick, too. Well, you're the person that I beat at jujitsu literally <laughs> nonstop. I owe him $100. Uh, <laughs> Patrick is yelling from the other side of this room that you owe him $100. Pa- Patrick is actually in this very room right now. I know it's a little awkward. You're you're trying to pit us against each other, but now it's two of us against you. I so, have ha- him in my episode saying I don't need to pay him that $100. So mm, there's that. We'll have to uh, figure this out off camera, I suppose. Perhaps I can beat you jujitsu. Actually, I would never bet on that. That would be dumb. But <laughs> especially because during this Corona, I hear that you have not been training and I have been going to secret jujitsu classes illegally. Shh, we're so to talk about this. Oh, that's true. Okay. Sorry. No. We, tell me about these secret training sessions. I mean, I don't want to get, I don't want to get my gym in trouble, but, uh, we have, we have taped up windows <laughs> so that you can't see inside. And, uh, we train by candlelight. In the middle of the night. (laughs) I think the same thing is going on out here too. It's going on everywhere. It is going on everywhere. I I feel like of all the potential ways of getting COVID, I can't think of a better way of getting it than jujitsu. Like literally another hairy dude sweating right in your mouth. I can't think of an easier way to get it, but it's weird because I have a lot of friends who have gotten it now. And none of my jujitsu buddies have gotten it. I don't know how. I That's don't know how. Trippy. Maybe they have and they just don't know. I mean, okay, I guess, but you know, obviously they're fine. They, yeah. They're very asymptomatic if they are getting it, which is great news. Maybe uh, jujitsu is the antidote. Well, now I'm, I'm very curious of the friends that you have that have gotten it. Have any had serious, serious so, consequences of whatever? I, I know two like friends of friends who have died, who are older. Oh, crazy. Okay. Older. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe one was in his fifties. So not that old. Still super young. Yeah. And then I think I know another, you know, again, this is friends of friends might've been in like late sixties or something. Um, but then I know I could probably count eight to 10 people who I know who have had it and wow. all the people who I am in contact with, like I have their cell phone in my phone. Um, they have all been fine. I have befriended one guy through these coronavirus journal things that we've been doing. Yeah. And he had really bad symptoms. So he, he was in the hospital for like two weeks. Um, he still has uh, symptoms to this day. I think he has problems breathing and stuff. And then I don't know if you've heard this, but he lost all of his hair like a month after recovering. This is a new symptom. Yes. Do you have COVID? (laughs) I barely had COVID like five years ago. (laughs) You have recovered from COVID already. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's nuts. I I can't believe you know that many people that have had it. Have you have you heard of the app called Hunala? 
<laughs> Can't say I have. Who I, I believe they named it Who from Hunan Province. I think that's where the virus came from, right? Uh, Hunala. Anyway, uh, some researchers at one of these schools, MIT or Stanford or something, have put this thing together. Uh, but you can actually enter your contacts from your phone and it'll tell you your regional risk of COVID and it'll tell you your specific risk of catching COVID based on the people that you regularly see. What? It's probably not good, uh, good podcast for me to start playing with an app right now, but let me just, let me just download it and I'll play wow. with it later. So how do you spell this? <laughs> You're that excited about it. Who na la. <laughs> Literally how it nah, sounds. Yeah. H-U. Okay. Nala. Got it. So I'm very Frack curious to outbreaks. see. <laughs> yeah. I'm very curious to see because my regional risk is high, but my group risk is very low based on the people that I regularly see. So you essentially put in like who you see on a weekly basis. Mike was one of them. I put Mike in and okay. you know, it, it told me the truth about Mike, that he's a Slightly dirty creepy. whore of a person that meets with everybody and is gonna no i'm just he's very clean and have you stopped going to the gym mike he's even stopped going to the gym look at this so you probably I'm the be dirtiest upset. guy you know mike would be upset if i would you be upset if i went back to jujitsu a little bit because i <laughs> haven't been able to go <laughs> a little bit that's mike's way of saying yes i would be incredibly pissed off here's the thing though like if you guys have to interact with each other anyway you guys could just jujitsu each other Ju is that the tech jujitsu ju ju each other? That's what I would do. Yeah. Or we could just BJJ each other. There was <laughs> an extra J worked. in there. <laughs> there was an extra, like, don't, don't take this out of context. Yeah. No um, hey, for quotables, I think Mike, that would be a great phrase right there. Like for little shorts that you could take out of this and that we could just post to social media. Um, so <laughs> in truth though, you did introduce me and, and I, I hear about this to this day where Justin's like, dude, I told you about jujitsu so many times, but then Lee got <laughs> you to go. And so now Lee's yeah. the buddy that got you to jujitsu. So you yeah. actually got me into jujitsu, um, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because really your first time and your first, I don't know, hundred times at jujitsu is just getting your butt kicked, but it was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm trying to remember you, your first time was down here in Puerto Rico, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, like I, I remember you being in a lot of classes, but I don't remember your first class very vividly. I'm first sure you do. Class right there with Moreno. Okay. Right there. Everyone's looking at me like fresh meat, like, Oh, we're going to beat this guy down. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you stuck with it. I, I am the biggest ambassador for jujitsu here in Puerto Rico, I've probably brought, without exaggerating, I've probably brought 15 people to jujitsu class now. Um, and the vast majority quit after one to two classes, but you stuck it out. I, I love it, man. I mean, and this is the funny thing is I, I'm in jujitsu. Uh, I love MMA and now I'm starting a podcast. So pretty much I, everybody's going to just say that I'm trying to be Joe Rogan, but yeah, for a long time, much. they were just trying to say I was being you. So I feel like this is a step up, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> although, although you could be trying to be both of us and you're a double poser. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the funniest the funniest statement that I've heard from people when I say I'm starting a podcast is, oh, you're trying to be like Joe Rogan. And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, like if you're going to do something, you might as well model it off someone that does it well. Like, I don't, I don't see how that's a, but people like to hate, dude. They love people definitely like to hate. And, uh, now that you say that, I want to, I want to be a little derogatory towards, uh, both you and Joe Rogan. Bring it. I, I, I'm a, I'm a Joe Rogan fan. Um, I, I, I don't listen to three hours of Joe Rogan every day. I, I for the most part, like listening to the Joe Rogan clips on YouTube, you know, just the best yeah, parts. Yeah. But if it's somebody crazy, like an Elon Musk, I'm, you know, I'm watching the whole thing. Um, but, uh, Joe had Kanye West on a few oh, yeah. days or weeks ago. He did. And I'm like, man, I got to watch this. Like I've been waiting on this for years. Um, and in my humble opinion, it was horrific. I feel like Kanye West is literally out of his mind. Kanye said nothing intelligent. Kanye could not stay on topic for 
literally 10 seconds. I mean, sentence to sentence, he was just riffing onto other things. And Joe has talked crap about Kanye for years and called him crazy. And then on this podcast, the few times Joe spoke up, he called him a genius and then he told him like, hey, you don't need to take your meds. Like if somebody told me to take meds, I'd never take meds. You're a genius. You don't, don't let doctors hold you down. And I, I was like offended the whole time I was watching this. I'm like, he's not a genius. He's literally out of his mind. And then I talked to you and you're like, you know, Kanye is a genius, right? That's not quite how it went. I think. Okay. How did it go? Well, we can actually look up the text. What was the text <laughs> maybe, message? Maybe I should. Maybe you should I should look up the text. But I think I said. Uh, you, you said something about, you know, whatever. And, and I do think it's kind of funny and, and a little bit odd that Joe has bagged on Kanye for so long. Um, and then it was very kind of flip script in the actual interview itself. But, um, I, I do feel like Kanye is a genius in many, many ways. Like, like I also think that he has ADHD and I, I know this because well, I have ADHD and I think he has it to a pretty, he probably has ADHD plus uh, some other things combined, which make it, his thought process is very erratic and he is all over the place, but you can't deny, how are you going to deny that he's a genius dude? And, and in ways, not in everything in ways. Okay. Give, give me, give me some ways. Music. Okay. Is Britney Spears a genius? Britney Spears didn't really write her music, dude. I mean, like, did Kanye write his music or did he just sample famous songs? Well, a lot of what he did was sampling, but a lot of what he did was also writing. And a lot of what he did was producing and, and putting it together in ways that were, I think, very I agree. different from everything out there. Like, it I, wasn't I, just I, good. I, it was different. I like I like his older albums. Have you heard his last gospel album? I have not heard the last gospel album. It is insanely bad. Insanely. I was really excited about it. It is uh, shockingly horrific. And so I, I just, when, when people say he's a genius, I, I don't mind if somebody was like, he's good at coming up with catchy tunes. I'd be like, okay, you know, Britney Spears can come up with some catchy tunes. Um, but to then go on and be like, yeah, Kanye should be president and Kanye should create That's new society. That's what I said though. <laughs> that is not <laughs> I, I, like, I agree. You didn't say that. You didn't say that. <laughs> there's a huge, there's a huge difference between thinking somebody is a creative genius and thinking that they have genius in a lot of their thoughts and a lot of the things that they do and thinking that they should run the country. Like, I, I don't okay. think. But what about the other crazy stuff? He's, he's always talking about, like, we got to rebuild society from the ground up. And, you know, I, I got these new designers working on the house of the future. And and then I'm going to make a new car and it's going to be a Tesla, but better. And it's just it's it sounds literally like like an eight year old speaking. Yes. But he's impressing you. He's winning you over. You're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you got to you got to stop with the lead duration. We're going to call these lead exaggerations or lead durations. <laughs> I have, I have the text messages here. Here, here it is. I don't know if you can see this. What, what uh, does it it's going to be too it bright. Out. It's going to be too bright. But it it says even so. I I can't remember if we spoke on the phone. Maybe we spoke on the phone. But I said even though you think Kanye is a genius, and you wrote, I do think he's a genius. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, well, I this is a, one of those topics where I said. We need to talk about this on the podcast. I do okay. think I'm not going to deny those words. I do think he is a creative genius. He's written some some pretty cool songs. It's not just that, man. I mean, he's come up with like an entire close, like all the things that he has done, which he is now a billionaire, obviously has required some level of uh, there has been a lot of foresight in many of the things okay. that he has done. Okay. So what about is, Britney Spears? Britney Spears also has tons of money. What about her? Well, I, I don't think it's just money by itself, right? So oh, Britney Spears. Oh, what Brit, else is it? I don't know enough about Britney Spears to really talk on it, but it seems like I don't think she has. Britney Spears has had some hit songs, which I believe all of which were written by other people. She was basically the performer of, right? As opposed to okay. Kanye, who has. So if nothing else, 
I would think we could agree on the fact that Kanye is musically a genius. Yeah or nay? Uh, I think you need to listen to his latest album. <laughs> and then get back to me on that. Okay. Agree to disagree. Um, I, I, will, I will say both, it, by your definition, both Kanye and Britney Spears are geniuses and they should be the next president of the United States. Okay, we can move on to the next topic if you'd like. Wow. <laughs> I mean, could it really be worse than what we've had? I mean, would it really be that much different? I would imagine it would. It would be different, but uh, yeah, I don't. I, I don't like when I think about when I thought about Trump being president four or five years ago. There was a sick part of me, maybe even the majority of me. I guess not because I didn't vote for him, but there was a part of me that was like, you know what? I kind of wish he was president. Like at the very least. It'll just be entertaining and all the late night shows, the jokes will be better and maybe he'll even blow up some stuff and maybe like, you know, we'll have to kind of rebuild at the end. Like he's not going to ruin the country, um, but it'll just kind of be funny, you know, and I and, and, and Trump's a good example. Like when you say Kanye is a genius and I think a lot of people would say Trump is a genius, like he's a business genius or whatever. I'm like, ah, I don't I don't think so. I, I think he's kind of dumb, too. I mean, I would think that there is some genius in his business mind. Yes. Like you, you, okay. I, I don't know. Maybe our definitions of genius are different, but I, yeah. I, I'm thinking that for me, genius is you demonstrate a level of intelligence in a certain area that is beyond significantly beyond the norm. And I would say musically Kanye has that. I would say creatively Kanye has that. And I would say from a business standpoint, Trump is likely to have a good piece of that. He also like uh, not. This is not to say that I endorse any of these people as our as our president by any means. Um, but I would also argue that Trump has genius in his playing of the media and playing of like you know people's interests and how to get attention and all this kind of stuff. Like there, there is some intelligence behind what he's doing. I don't think it's just dumb luck. Well, I mean, that, that, there could be some truth to that. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, though. Uh, when Trump was running for president, I, I did find a lot of the stuff that he said to be entertaining and humorous. But at the end of the day, I was like, I can't vote for him. Like, I don't want a, a clown to be the president. It's kind of embarrassing for our country. So I don't like Hillary, but I'm going to vote for Hillary. But Patrick hated Hillary. So Patrick was like, I got to vote for Trump. And I'm like, how can you do this? He's out of his mind. Like he just says stuff that doesn't even make any sense. He doesn't even understand the way the government works. This is crazy. And Patrick's like, no, Lee, you don't understand. Trump is playing 4D chess with the media. He's pretending to be crazy right now. So he gets free press, but this isn't who he is. Like nobody actually acts like this in real life. So if he becomes president, he's going to act presidential. Wow. How did that work out? <laughs> that, that's a very interesting line of reasoning based on someone who's shown no historical evidence of being anything but the way he is. I guess it's fun. I mean, when you look back, you know, the footage that get keeps getting shared around of him like 20, 30 years ago on Oprah and she's asking him if he would ever want to be president. And he speaks so much better and he 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 seems reasonable. He's not brash. His answers sound thoughtful back then. So he has become more insane throughout his life, for sure. <laughs> you know what? You threw me into the deep end of such an interesting conversation that I forgot our ritual. I, I got to light a candle. Whenever we start filming, dude, we have to light a candle. So Why is that? It's my ritual, bro. It's my ritual. Okay, bro. Yeah, now, now, now we're good. Well, so what are, what are your thoughts with, uh, with this new lockdown in California? Cause we have, we have Mike Kelly here right now. He's, he's currently filming in our main set. That's the reason why I look different than I normally do. But, um, he was telling me that you guys are starting a second lockdown now as we're filming this. Yes. Um, and that even outdoor dining is now banned. 
Correct. And Mike and I actually learned about this today. It was your business partner and friend, Patrick, who told us. Um, Honestly, from the way we've been living, nothing is different. I mean, if you were going out and you were partying and you were like living it up right now, then yeah, it seems like there's a difference. But we've already been doing this whole thing. But it's crazy. I, I like I still wonder and a lot of people do like that. Like what is the long-term economic and mental health impact of what we're doing in quarantine compared to what is going to be the impact in terms of economic damage or not economic damage in terms of like actual real loss of life. Um, Absolutely. That's always what we have to uh, try to weigh. And, uh, but there's what no way drives. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I mean, yeah, there, there's no way of knowing. Um, but at the same time, I despise the people who are, are these white knights online and you don't see them anymore. You don't see them anymore. But when COVID was hitting hard back in like March, April, May. Yeah. And all these people were like, if I, if I could save one life, I'm happy to be locked down for an entire year. And then, you know, they get all the upvotes and people are like, wow, Johnny, you're a, you're my hero. And I'm like, what, what if people who ran this world thought like this, you know, it's like, if one person dies, then we, then we cannot ever drive a car again. If one person dies, we cannot eat meat you know we have to only eat the cleanest of vegetables it's just like you could do that with every single aspect of your life and so uh luckily these white knights they got tired of it you know and they're like i kind of want to go to a restaurant so you don't hear from them anymore on social media (laughs) what johnny uh, didn't say was that he abstains from doing anything productive with his life anyway so this isn't really i mean it certainly seems that way it certainly seems that way and then and then people are just like Yeah, we should be locked down until the vaccine comes out and the government should just pay everyone to stay inside. And I'm like, where does that money come from? I don't understand what the game plan is here. And then I always thought the conservative position was fiscal responsibility, you know, and then all of a sudden Trump's in office and all the Republicans act like he's the greatest president ever. And we're just printing money like never before. And it's supposed to not affect our dollar at all. And I I guess another stimulus is going to be coming soon in the next few months. You know what I feel right now? I feel feel? your, I feel your Tesla short anger coming out. Is your Tesla (laughs) short anger coming out? (laughs) So, so a little bit, just for everybody. Yeah. We have a, a group thread, um, with Patrick and Mike and, and Lee and, uh, and Mike has funneled, all of his money into Tesla. <laughs> Dumb luck. Granted. Uh, well, not all of his money, but a good bit of money, a good bit of money. Um, yeah. well, meanwhile, uh, Lee has put a good chunk of change into a Tesla short position. <laughs> that is, uh, <laughs> s- <laughs> right. Right before the pandemic hit, I was like, this pandemic's coming. We're about to be in lockdown. There's no way luxury electric cars are going to do well. Um, this isn't a long term bet, but look, they're gonna they're gonna crash, and so I put twenty thousand dollars into a Tesla short, and a few weeks after I did it, look at Pi laughing right now. I've never seen Pi so happy in my life. I'm not happy. I'm 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 <laughs> laughing you, because you I'm, are so I'm happy. Laughing because everything that you're saying makes complete logical sense. Everything that you're saying is like, yes, in a recession, people should not be buying. $100,000 electric cars that can't run on gas. Like everything that you're saying makes complete sense. Obviously yeah. the Tesla price is going to go down and it's just so ironic that what has happened is literally the complete opposite. So, so keep going to a $20,000 position. Yeah. So it was going to be a short-term position and I actually was right. The stock did go down and I had made like Everybody's I don't know right how much money I had made at one point in time. Dude. <laughs> I guess that's true. But I, I was right, like immediately after I did it. And uh, I, I, I was up like five grand or something. I don't remember. And my wife was like, oh, now that you're up, you should close that position. And I was like, nah, 
Tesla's dropping by 50%, I guarantee it. Well, instead of dropping by 50%, Tesla went up five times. Um, so my, I, I think maybe from my short position, it's now gone up 3X. <laughs> and so I have lost 20, 40, 60. I've lost right around $60,000 as of today. But I believe if Tesla's stock reaches $585 a share, I will have lost $65,000 <laughs> and my stop loss will like close the position and I will have realized that loss. So it's literally the worst financial decision of my life betting against my uh, hero, Elon Musk. And I will never do it again, Elon. I apologize. No, I, I believe I did. I mean, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but I believe I did give you my thoughts on like short positions. Do you remember what that was? You might've given me your thoughts on short positions. You also gave Patrick your thoughts on the stock market and Patrick lost a lot more than $65,000 by taking your advice. A lot more. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he's no, up maybe now. about it. <laughs> yeah, he's up now. He's up now. But um, the, the losses he realized when you told him to sell were I told him horrific. to sell before the whole thing went down. <laughs> That's true. And then it went down at like 30% and then losses my, or whatever. Yeah, my next piece and then of you advice told, was you were like, not, sell, sell, sell. Well, I said, I said, if I were in your position, I don't see it going anywhere. Like it has to keep going down. It only makes sense. But of course, nothing makes sense. Nothing, it nothing make makes sense. sense in like financially right now. You, you go around, you look at everything like nobody's working. I mean, not not nobody, but a lot of people are out of work. Um, you've got unemployment rates up. You've got spending down. You've got all these things going on. You've got the only thing that the economy is riding on is this crazy stimulus package and this hope. Like it's just stimulus and hope. None of it makes financial sense. So it don't make no damn sense. Yeah. So <clears throat> speaking of dumb luck, you started F stoppers. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was lucky to be honest. I mean, not lucky in the sense I that I so. stumbled upon it. Like I, I, we made it purposefully and it took a lot of work to make it, but we got lucky in the sense that we never planned on it being a business. We were just kind of doing it as a hobby. Well, and, and you're, you're going to be super humble about this. So I'm going to go ahead and toot your own for a second. Um, but if you guys watch the episode with Patrick, then you know that Lee is Patrick's business partner and F stoppers is a little website that they started about 10 years ago, um, which now is a multi-million dollar business. Um, they boast, I don't know, Patrick was saying somewhere like three to, he gave me the most ridiculous number. We have anywhere between two to 5 million unique visitors a month. And I'm like, that's a huge range, dude. Like what, <laughs> what, <laughs> I have I anywhere think, between like think, one and 500,000 people on my site a month. Yeah. I think uh, the other month we had like 7 million page views. So okay. I don't know how many uniques that is. That's probably like 3 million uniques, 4 million uniques. That's pretty crazy. I think that's pretty maybe. Crazy. I mean, isn't SLR lounge just like that? No. You guys are close. You guys are very close to us. No, we are one third to, we've always been one third to one fourth your size. And, and, Okay. I mean, that's pretty close. Not really. <laughs> no, <laughs> I feel like it is. I feel like it is. <laughs> but I, I appreciate your kindness. But I was asking Patrick, and I, I wanted to ask you this question because Patrick had a hard time putting this on, on anything. Um, well, first, I wanted to see if your kind of take on everything was similar. Um, I want to know, you, you got fired from Ritz Camera 12 years ago? <laughs> Was that 12 years ago? Um, may, it was probably a little longer than that, but yes, yeah, go on. Okay. <laughs> to, the story is so ridiculous that you have to watch. Like you have an episode on YouTube. <laughs> what is it called? It's called like Risk Camera Chronicles. I, well, so yeah. So we did the, we did this series. It's like six videos called the Ritz Camera Chronicles. And you can see that. I made a huge mistake with the, with the naming of our final video, because the final video is the story of me getting fired. And it's, it's hilarious if I do say so myself, but I named it the greatest story ever told. But then I realized the greatest story ever told is the story of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that's what like movies and books are named. 
<laughs> so it's the, the worst SEO decision ever. <laughs> You didn't, you didn't research that at all, did you? No, I just was like, I always told people I've got the greatest story ever to tell you. So I just put that in and hit publish. And then a week later I looked and I, I typed that in and it was like 20 Jesus videos were ahead of mine. And I'm like, oh no. Oh, no. Wait, you can't change the name after the fact? I probably could. Maybe I even <laughs> did. I don't remember. I, once I make a bad decision, I just ride it out for the rest of my life. Like that Tesla short. Well, yep. <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, Jesus' story is pretty impressive, but I think this might hold a candle to it. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, true. We're both, we're competing for number one on YouTube right now. <laughs> it, it's an, it's an amazing story. You guys have to listen to that. Um, and obviously there's more things that I would love for our listeners to do other than just that, like, like checking out F stoppers and the education you guys create and everything. But, um, don't bother just the greatest just story the ever greatest, told just the Ritz Ritz camera, camera chronicles. Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> But what's funny about this is you you kind of left Ritz camera. You're a wedding photographer. And was there any plan for like, what was the plan for F stoppers when you guys launched the site? What was your, your idea of it? So a couple of things. Um, one thing was I was starting to realize who I looked up to in my life. And I started to realize that, like, for instance, I started assisting photographers whose work I found to be amazing, right? Mm -hmm. But after working for them for a few weeks and seeing what they did, they weren't Lost uh, the shine. magical anymore. Yeah. yeah, it was just like they're like, I could do that, right? Yeah. And I'd watch them negotiate with the clients and I'm like, holy crap, like they're asking for a ton of money, more money than I would ever dream to ask. But they're doing it with such confidence and I'm looking like they're, they're, they're getting five grand and then doing a photo shoot in 10 minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I want to do this, you know? And then I started going online and strobist was big back then. And, um, I never felt like I, I love David hobbies, um, uh, tutorials and stuff that he put on his website, but I never felt like his photography was mind blowing or anything. Yeah. And then Ch chase Jarvis came out. And yeah. Chase Jarvis was like the first high-end commercial photographer who was making behind-the-scenes videos. Before that, everyone was kind of hiding their techniques and stuff. For sure. And part of it was it was just harder to film um, yeah, content. Easy. Yeah. And there was nowhere to put it. You know, this is kind of like when YouTube was just coming out and stuff. But I started watching these Chase Jarvis videos, and I was like, man – these videos are awesome. This is the content that I've always been interested in that I keep reading Strobus to try to like figure out how people are lighting images and stuff. But now I can see it and I don't have to read because I'm lazy. So I just approached Patrick. We were just buddies at the time. And I was like, look, I got this URL called F stoppers. I, I own a ton of URLs that I never do anything with. And uh, I said, let's make a Strobus type website. But instead of written post, let's do behind the scenes videos. That was the whole idea. Yeah. But I, I do also remember telling him, I was like, I bet if we just put ourselves out there, I bet we could become well-known in the industry like Chase Jarvis. Like we're, we're never going to be as famous, uh, like commercial photographers as him. That was never our goal, but maybe we could become just as well-known within the photography community as him. It yeah. just comes down to like just putting stuff out there and we'll try to do our best to make good content. And, uh, but it was never, we never thought you could make money doing it. I, maybe I thought in my mind, like, maybe we'll get like a camera before it comes out or something. Maybe that was like the, the peak of my imagination of what could come true, you know? And then maybe like, uh, a year or two in, we made our first tutorial with Peter Hurley that we sold Yeah, and it just made a lot of money and we, we just never thought that would be possible. And then maybe a year after that, or two years after that, I don't know. We started making more money with F stoppers than we were with our wedding business. And then we did both for a while, but then, you know, a few years ago, we just decided like, Oh, let's we, just focus. It's, yeah. It's better to focus on F stoppers. That's rad, dude. I, I feel like, um, a, a lot of like what I've been doing recently is, is, um, kind of trying to help and coach photographers and, and just, entrepreneurs and creatives that want to kind of like get out and, and start and do something. Um, 
And one of the craziest things is that people spend really a ton of time in this planning process and they want like their product to be perfect. They want their plan to be perfect. They want everything to be dialed into this like, like level of perfection. That's just impossible. Uh, and they almost like perpetually wait. And so I was very curious to hear like if your take on it was similar to Patrick's and it is, it, it, it's very similar in that you have an idea of where you want to go, but then you just got out and actually started doing something. You were creating content and starting to move and starting to create, but yeah. And I don't think, I don't think I would have done it without Patrick. I think I would have lost steam, but when I would lose steam, he would be like, Hey man, I'm coming over. We got to film a video and vice versa. And so I think that's the only way we were able to push through, you know, that first, like maybe three to six months when the website didn't exist, but we were teaching ourselves to make the website and we were teaching ourselves how to edit video and film video and act in video. And then we had to come up with these photo shoot ideas from scratch and like come up with content to make all the time. It's fun for a second, but then like a lot of what's fun about producing things is putting it out into the world and then getting a response for sure. But at the beginning of F stoppers, there was no F stoppers. So we were just making content and holding on to it and waiting, counting down the day until like, maybe when we post this, someone will see it, but probably not. Yeah. And if I had to do it by myself, I probably, I probably wouldn't have followed through. That's so interesting. Cause I've, I've had a similar sentiment just about going into business in general. Now, Maybe this is me having just written a book on relationships, but I am curious. And while I have you on the spot, what kind of drew you into your friendship with Patrick? Because I, I, I wouldn't like knowing the two of you separate. I wouldn't look at you guys and be like, oh, they're going to be best friends. I know it is. It is kind of weird. I think. I'm trying to think like all the stuff that we like for the most part is pretty, pretty different stuff. But when we used to work at Ritz camera together before I was fired unjustly, (laughs) I, uh, I was just obsessed with photography. And then when I started teaching it to Patrick, he became obsessed with it. And then we were just like equals and each, every day, I like every day we would hang out and we would do these test photo shoots. This was long before we came up with the F stoppers idea. We'd be like, let's try to shoot a product. Let's try to shoot a portrait. Let's try to shoot a dog. And we'd just come up with stuff. And then we started shooting stock photography together. And we were just like, it was just more fun with another person. And then I remember like, we didn't have much money, but I approached him one day. I was like, listen, we need to sign up for the freedom boat club in Charleston. It's like this, uh, <laughs> timeshare for boats. And, uh, at, like no one else in my life would have done it, right? Everybody's like, "No, it costs too much money." I need, I'm, you know, I'm getting older. I need to save. I need, and Patrick was like, "Okay, I think that's a good idea." So it's things like that that make us good friends, you know. Was that the boat club that you guys like used to the nth degree? Oh yeah, we we joke like so for the past couple of years we've been here in Puerto Rico, but we have continued our membership in Charleston for the boat club. And everyone's like, guys, you're getting ripped off. Like you only use the boat club a couple times a year, which is true. We are getting ripped off now, but we ripped them off so bad for the first like four years. We would go out five days a week on these boats and it was free. Like once you pay the the monthly membership fee, it was free to go out. And most people have lives and jobs. So they would go out like once a month, we'd go out five days a week. And so we ran those boats into the ground. So I feel a little bit better about continuing my membership, even when I'm not using it right now. (laughs) You're helping them to recoup losses, which fortunately, apparently they're still in business. So you didn't hurt them that bad. Exactly. But that's interesting though. So, so being, I I can see the interest in photography as like kind of pulling guys together, but it, it is very interesting from the fact that like, Patrick, I guess you play music too, though. You play drums. He plays a little bit guitar. I used to play guitar. Yeah. Patrick is pro level guitar player. Like he tried to be in a rock band. I used to play, you know, casual guitar in college. And then a couple of years ago, I just got a digital drum kit and I can keep a very simple beat. So I could do like a, a jam session where I keep a beat, but there's no way I can play the drums like they're a supposed to be played in the song, you know? Yeah. So the average person doesn't know. They're like, wow, he's good at drums. But Patrick is like, that's not the way the drums go. <laughs> he can hear it. 
<laughs> he stops the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So like we haven't, we've been living in the same house together for two years now and we have not jammed together once in two years. That's hilarious. And we and used to, we used to do it in Charleston cause we had other bandmates, but here we don't have any bandmates. Well, and when I'm there most of the time, I didn't see you guys like, like, like you go to jujitsu, you kind of go do your own thing. You're hanging out with Katie and, and for the most yeah. part outside yeah. of production, I didn't see you guys together all that much. And I was, I was, no. I've always been very curious kind of what the initial draw is. So, so today, what do you feel like kind of keeps you guys together beyond just your business interest, obviously? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, you would be right. I, 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 I'm curious to hear if you ask Patrick the same question, but I don't think like we don't hang out that much here. Um, we see each other at meals because we have a shared kitchen, but uh-huh. like he has his own floor of this house and he basically stays here. And then I have my own floor that I work on. And if we need help on something, we help each other. And then if we do like dinners, if we go out to a restaurant, we'll eat together. Yeah. Tomorrow we're taking the boat out here and we've got a big group of people. So we'll hang out on stuff like that. But like he has no interest in jujitsu, golf or kiteboarding. And those are my favorite things here. Yeah. That's so it's very interesting to me because and I didn't ask him this question, but um, I am curious, like if you were to if you were to put this into kind of like a, a piece of what you feel like has made your business partnership successful, like if you were to put this into a few pieces of advice, what would it actually be? I mean, maybe just like honesty and being a reasonable person, you know, like I'm, we've, we've been business partners now for over 10 years and the very few times we have had arguments about something, we have always within usually minutes been able to just be like, okay, like, sure, we'll do it your way. And it's, we never have talked about it again. Like, I don't think we've ever had a serious fight about anything. Um, no, I'm and curious you know, about you know, what your reference yeah. is to arguing, because when I see you guys work together, I see you guys have what I would call an argument. It's just a small conflict, um, but I see it happening regularly. I actually did talk to him about that. Uh, and I was, I was like, you guys actually have disagreements on things and you work through them very adeptly. It's, it's, it's like you saying, so I don't call that, uh, like if, if I'm like, I think we should put the light here. And he's like, I think we should put it here. I don't call that a disagreement. I call uh a disagreement like, uh, like, Hey, um, you, I'm, I'm trying to even come up with something like, like something that's a little tricky is that F stoppers in Charleston, our office is a building attached to Patrick's house. Yeah. So F stoppers pays Patrick rent. Okay. And now F stoppers rents both the front and the back of his house. Yeah. So Patrick can kind of set the price however he wants. And then I have to play negotiator a position of like F stoppers and be like, well, hold on. It's yeah. not, it's not worth what you're trying to get, you know? But we've never, like, I, we've probably talked about it for like a few minutes over the course of the last five years. Yeah. And, you know, every few years, like the price needs to change or go up or whatever. And he's like, I think it should be this. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I, like, honestly, I cannot think, I can't think of when, when I say argument, I'm talking about something where like we are upset about something. There's like emotions getting involved. Yeah. Like something about something, even if it's, or, or even if it's stupid, like, yeah. My wife and I have gotten in arguments. I would say every single one of the arguments Katie and I have gotten into are over the dumbest stuff ever. <laughs> and mostly it's just, it, it really boils down. And you you would know as the, the book guy, but it really boils down to like, it doesn't seem like you're thinking or caring of me. That's what it is. But it comes out as, why don't you ever vacuum the house? And I'm yeah. like, because I have this other business and I'm happy to pay someone to vacuum the house. So like, you don't, I'm not asking you to vacuum the house. Just if you don't like doing it, then let's hire someone. And then she's like, I don't want to hire someone. You should like, that's not honestly not even an argument that's ever happened, but that's something that would happen with us. And it could get to the point where like, both of us are a little annoyed at each other and it's like over vacuuming. Like it makes no sense, but it's not the vacuuming. That's the real problem. Right. But my point is Patrick and I, that never happens to us. 
Well, okay. So on a very minute level, I've been with you guys in production when like, say for example, uh, Patrick was like, let's go to San Juan, downtown San Juan. We're going to go and film there. And you're like, why would we go to downtown San Juan when we have a perfectly good place? We could just film right here. And it right. was, you know, we're going to hire these models. And and so it, I see the back and forth, you know, and one of my huge arguments in all relationships is that that conflict is a very necessary, healthy, and ultimately a good thing for not only a business partnership, but also like just general relationships that usually you can gauge the strength of a relationship by whether or not they're, they're willing to deal with conflict. Like how many, uh, how many of your friendships would you say, like, if we actually encountered conflict, I probably just like kind of let it go. You know, it's just not, it's not worth like, you know, sure. Going into something about it. Sure. But I, I also feel like I can see where if I were to boil down certain things like that I saw in you guys, it's, you guys can handle conflict well, but that also helps in the product that you guys are creating. Like you actually, you actually will openly state your opinion to the instructors that you guys have on camera. I think we need to do this. Our audience needs to see this. Um, you're both not afraid to like kind of speak very openly about things. So in addition to like shared interest, it feels like from my side and watching, you guys have shared values and then you have similar approaches and you have all these different things that are kind of going for you guys. So I, I, I was very curious to see your take on it though. Uh, I, I think I, I think I agree. I just feel like we're just very reasonable with stuff and you're right. Like I remember the argument about going to San Juan. I didn't want to do it. Um, Patrick does want to do it. I think the differences and why I don't consider that like a legitimate or serious argument is because when I think of legitimate argument, I think of like, you're holding on to it for days or weeks or months. Yeah. You don't want to see the person anymore. You can tell when you're in the same room, there's something weird eating at both of you, That's like a you know, battle. and like, <laughs> yeah, like that, that was not what was going on with San Juan. No, no, That's Patrick, all. like saying like, I think there's better pictures there. And I'm like, no, there's plenty of pictures here and I'm lazy and I don't want to drive two hours to, to get this shoot done. But I don't even remember like which, t like, I think we've had this argument like 10 times, but maybe in that one, I was like, fine, we'll go. Yeah. Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah. You, you conceded on that one. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, the way that I define conflict is, um, you know, like conflict can be something that's internal. It can be something that's external, like someone, someone doing something stupid outside of your relationship. But then the fact that you have to deal with it with your friend or with whoever, you know, or it could be something that you guys do on your own, but it doesn't have to be like, you know, yelling and angry and that kind of stuff. I, I found that both of you have very similar approaches to conflict and conflict resolution, um, where you kind of both just calmly, casually state your opinions. And, and one of you usually is kind of like, okay, like, let's just go and do this thing. And you're both very kind of mild mannered. If for example, though, let's say Patrick would, you know, blow up and be like, Lee, you never ever want to do anything that I want to do. And if he was very dramatic with each of these like instances, then yeah. I think you would actually see that conflict. It would, it would be very apparent, but because you guys manage conflicts similarly, you're very fluid with it. It kind of just happens. You're probably right about that. Patrick treats electronics like that. So <laughs> he will have meltdowns uh, where he he is. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think he will die one day of some sort of heart malfunction because like the computer software doesn't work or uh, Adobe Photoshop changed their icons I've, again and I I've can't find this. the brush tool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've seen those meltdowns. <laughs> luckily, he has never he has never done that at me. So when he does it, I can just kind of laugh and walk away. But yeah, if he treated me like that, then I don't think I could be close friends with him. Yeah. Like it would just be such a different style and approach from your own. Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was interesting because I, I get asked the question a lot of like, Hey, I'm thinking of going into business with so-and-so. What do you think? Is that a good idea? And what do I, what should I look for in it? And my first Cause like, you know, there, there's not enough time to sit them down and be like, here's everything that you should look at. So my first question is always, do you guys fight? 
And the answer is almost in every single occasion is no, we never argue. We never fight. We never have any problems. And that's why I think it's a good fit. And my response is no, that's why it's going to be absolutely terrible. Run the other direction. (laughs) Don't do it at all. Like this is going to be bad because if you've never, I mean, you're talking about going into business with someone, which is going to be ratcheting up the intensity of the relationship. You're going from friendship to marriage. And clearly there's going to be tons of opportunities for conflict. And if you don't even know how to manage that, what a, what a terrible notion. And anyway, each of these cases, most of the people will go and do the complete opposite of what I recommend. And every time I followed up their businesses or their partnerships have, uh, well, fallen apart very poorly. Yeah. You know, it's kind of tough because both of us have seen success having partners. Yeah. But everyone else I know, their yeah. partnerships have been nightmares. And it's, it's kind of similar to marriage, you know, like the sure. majority of people I know have incredibly unhappy or failed marriages, <laughs> but my parents have a great marriage. Yeah. And it's like the only one I have to look at. And uh, I, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about this recently is, uh, you know, you know, when guys and girls are, you know, especially when they're getting to our age, we're in our th- late thirties, I guess at this point, bro, I'm 40, but you, keep going. <laughs> oh gosh. Sorry, man. I didn't realize it was that bad, but, um, they'll, they'll say stuff like, uh, there's just, you know, there's just no good men or there's no good women out there or whatever. And I'm always thinking in the back of my head, like, yeah, but you're not good. <laughs> That's very like, true. You, 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 uh, um, you have been hooking up with people for years and you can't control your emotions and your life is in, uh, total shambles and, uh, you ha- are an alcoholic and all of these yeah. things that make you a bad partner, whether with the opposite sex or, you know, with a business partner or whatever. And then, and then they're like, when I meet these people, they're always horrible people. But I'm, I'm always thinking in the back of my head, but you're a horrible person too. And it's impossible <laughs> to say that. <laughs> it's yes, impossible say that. to say that. But like, I, and I'm friends with a lot of these people. Like I can, I can be friends with people and keep them at arm's length. But no, I would never in a million years get involved with them monetarily. Do you 100%. understand what I'm saying? Oh, for sure. Because... Uh, this is actually one of the concepts that I, I talk about a lot. Um, but it's the fact that like, you know, in general, from friendships to, you know, romances to business partnerships in general, you're kind of typically looking for the same things. The only difference is that your expectations get ratcheted up with the intensity of the relationship. So the closer of friends you're going to be with somebody, the more expectation you have that their values are in line with yours, that like, you know, the things that you do, and then you take it to a marriage level and the expectations get even higher. You take it to a business level. The expectations are the same. But the crazy part, like you said, is that people will just be complete messes. And if you're like, what, are you looking for in a partner or what are you looking for in a business partner? Or what are you looking for in this? They will list out every single thing that they are not. I know, I know. And it's very difficult to explain this or if not impossible to explain that to someone. Yeah. I think it has to be in a book that they read for themselves. (laughs) Like, I think what you can do is hand them the book and be like, you're doing good. I'd recommend this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, like I'll be, I'll, I'll be out to dinner with somebody and they'll, they'll be joking about like this shady business thing that they did, you know, yeah. where maybe it's not illegal, but it's definitely immoral. And that the, you know, they were able to scam somebody out of something by, you know, not reveal, like me, you're selling your company and you're not revealing something that's really negative that happened to your company. And you're like bragging about how you got away with it. You know, yeah. like I, they bought it and they never found that lawsuit, <laughs> you know, and I'm just thinking in the back of my head, like that's crazy. you're, you're going to do this to your business partner if you ever had one. And you're going to do this to your spouse if you ever have one. Um, and I, yeah, again, I, I just, I don't know how to make that clear to people without totally offending them. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's possible to give people any sort of advice that is unsolicited and most especially when it comes to the realm of relationships like 
I have actually learned well, this very well firsthand. But it is solicited, especially with you. People come to you all the time and say, Pi, I just can't find someone who's normal. Please buy. And you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, you're out of your damn mind. Yeah, well, that's the, yes, I've had quite a few people that have, it's really funny. In the process of, of writing this book, I've let a few people know and word has kind of gotten out in this circle. And I just get these calls from time to time of like, hey, so-and-so gave me your number. You're writing a book on this. They told me you could help me out. And we get into these conversations and you know, what's weird is I think of the 10, so 10, I, I probably have consulted with 10 people directly, like, like repeatedly. And of the 10, I would say only three were genuinely interested in changing. The other seven just wanted me to validate their positions does that make sense? So like they would call yeah, me yeah. and basically be like, so-and-so is a piece of shit and like this. And like, I don't, I don't, you know, this is who I'm married to. And this is what, you know, this is, and this is my business partner and this is this. And, and they would just go off and they kind of just want me to go. Yeah, you're right. They're a really bad person and you should get divorced or break up your business. And when I don't say that they get really angry. And I'm like, dude, you called me like you, you literally reached out to me about this. And I'm telling you that you are equally responsible for each of these pieces and here's how to fix it. And you're telling me that, you know, that's not what you were. Expecting. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Um, I, I, and, and I hope that I'm not like that, you know, like everybody, like we can all justify whatever we have done, you know, any decision we have made. Well, obviously we have a reason for it. We made that decision so we can justify in our mind. I hope that if somebody would come to me and be like, Hey, Lee, man, you were really out of line when you need to blah or whatever, you know, my wife, like usually that would be the big one <laughs> that I would be open minded enough to be like, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to do better with that. But yeah, the average person doesn't like to think that they could have made a mistake. I, I, I feel like you're a very introspective person. And in general, if you are introspective, you would do that. Like one of the things that kind of, Maybe. um, and, and we're getting into a lot of relationships stuff with this kind of fun, but one of the things that's always drawn me to you as well as Patrick is your candor. Like you just are, you are who you are. You are authentic. What you say is what you mean. Um, there's no, nothing you guys say has pretenses to it. And, and, and you say what you mean type thing. I, I feel like if I were to come to you and say something in a similar manner and say, Hey, you know, Lee, this is something that I've noticed. Um, you think we can work on this? You would 100% accept it, dude. Like there's like knowing who you are, that is who you are. But well, I hope so. I appreciate that. Most people are not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I, you know, I think I could just attribute that to my parents who like, I've never, my parents never raised their voice at each other ever, yeah. not once. That's um, crazy. And so to me, raising your voice, I raise my voice all the time at Patrick. Like we have, <laughs> we have uh spirited debates about things, but it's never in anger. You do it in a fun it's, way. Yeah. Yeah. We do it in a fun way or, uh, you have the leave yeah, voice. God yeah, damn it. <laughs> yeah. But like people who yell at each other when they're angry, I'm like, damn, you are out of yeah. your mind. Like this, this is not how adults, like this is how little kids act. You know, people don't yell at each other when they're mad, but a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. And the other weird part about it is if, is if, uh, if two people naturally approach conflict by yelling, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily meaning the doom of like their friendship, their relationship, their like, so they could be screaming at each other, but everything's good. <laughs> it's just so how I've they never, naturally act. I don't think I've ever run across this people, or maybe what it is, is I, maybe I have run across those people, but I try to stay away from them because I feel like they're horrible people. But maybe in your opinion, they're not horrible people that that's just how they communicate. I mean, you know, like, I, I don't want to break this down to like area, but I feel like, um, in New York, people are very vocal and they will yell at each other, but that is just naturally how they respond to a situation. And I've actually seen a recent video where like two people start out yelling at each other and then they immediately like soften up. And I think it was because one, one dude stole the other guy's bike 
And at first they start like yelling at each other. This dude stole this guy's bike. And the guy's like, I stole because I need to get to work. And the other guy's like, oh man, you need to get to work? Oh, I didn't mean to like just start yelling at you for stealing my bike, but you know, why don't you come and you can borrow the bike? <laughs> and like, this was, it was the weirdest thing to watch. But I do feel like people have different ways of uh, managing conflict and more important than like good conflict resolution skills is that two people kind of approach it in a similar manner. Granted, it's not very effective to be yelling at each other, you know? It sure, it sure doesn't seem like it, but, uh, you are the expert in this field. I am not an expert in anything, dude. I'm, I've, I've written a, a book, which by the way, what was your thought when I told you, I think I told you about this in Alaska, right? I said I was writing a book on relationships Maybe I, I can't remember what I had for dinner one hour ago. I don't, I don't know when you told me about the book, but, uh, I don't know. Like I, I just, I feel like everything you do, you strive for excellence. So I, I never once thought like that you wouldn't be able to do it or anything like that. Interesting. I, I, I was, ex- I was excited to read it. Hmm. Interesting. Well, as I know you, where are you at on the hot sauce? So Lee, again, for our listeners, <laughs> Lee, and I didn't get a chance to ask Patrick this. Maybe you guys have completely different plans, but I'm very curious what your next phase is. But currently you're working on a high end boutique hot sauce. Well, yes. so yeah, kind of. So I've got three little side projects going right now. One, I too started writing a book, but it was years ago. <laughs> And I haven't opened it in months. You need to work on it. And my, yeah, I do. My wife is uh, pregnant with our first child and uh, is supposed to uh, give birth in February. So we have to go back to the States to do all that. And I'm going to be, I think, kind of sitting around bored a lot. Yeah. And so I thought maybe I could open that book up and just go hard for like a month and a half and maybe I could finish it. And- that would honestly bring me a lot of joy because I could finish it. But also if I could get it done in a month and you have been working on it for years, that would make me feel better about myself. <laughs> Listen, I wrote all the words into a document within a couple months, but then those uh-huh. words sucked and they had to okay. be refined. Yeah. yeah. The difference between me is you is I'm going to write the words good from the beginning okay. and then I'm going to be done. Cut yeah. It. You're going to be the um, first author to ever just pen perfection. <laughs> you just, yeah, it just spews out of me. That's what I plan on doing. And then I'll probably just hire an editor to just like handle it. And then I will never read it again. So I won't <laughs> know if it's good or bad. And then I'll just put it up for sale. That's my dream. But anyway, that's something that I need to get back onto. But I honestly, I don't think I've opened it in three years. So I should probably do that. Um, the other two things, one hot sauce, I have created a hot sauce, which is my favorite hot sauce ever. And it's legitimately Katie's good. favorite hot sauce. And Mike Kelly's currently here. He said it's his favorite hot sauce of all time. All three of us are hot sauce connoisseurs. I've, we like, have tried all this? the finest hot sauce. What the hell? Did I you also you. say you? Yes, it was, the it finest was my as favorite well. too. Right. Well, I thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so <laughs> my idea is that, uh, there's no, there's no market for luxury hot sauce. The most expensive hot sauce that's easy to find that I can find is called truff hot sauce. It's this yeah. truffle hot sauce. And I bought a few of those bottles, uh, and I do like them. I do like them, but I want to go even more expensive and I want to go even fancier of a bottle. And I was going to create this product and another one with the same guy. My other product (laughs) was called hat mask clips. (laughs) And it's these little clips that go on the sides of a hat so that you can connect a mask to your hat rather than your ears. And then you can put the mask up under the hat when you're not, you know, you can't even see it. It's just under the hat. Well, the problem is we've done so much. Like I got the logo, I got the packaging, I got the design of the product. I have everything. And the guy that I'm working with he designs products for a living and and we're close friends. And he kind of 
stopped responding to me. You haven't heard this before, have you, Pi? I, I only got to the place where I saw the packaging and the product looked legit. Yeah. Like it was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So this happened right after I sent you that that uh picture. He he kind of just stopped responding to me for two weeks, which is unlike him. And I honestly got worried that something had happened to him. And oh, no. he told me that he was going to Columbia to work on to like find a manufacturer or something. And I'm like, dude, he got killed in Columbia. That's oh, really, no. really what I was yeah. thinking. Cause I messaged him so many times. Well, he finally responded and uh, his business is in serious trouble because all of these companies that he had purchased, he designs products pre-purchases them, holds them in warehouses in China, and then ships them out to the other warehouses around the world where they'll be distributed. Oh, yeah, I can. All yeah, of these companies at once just said like, hey, we're like certain departments of our company are declaring bankruptcy. We don't want that inventory anymore. And he's like, but I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in inventory. What am I supposed to do with this? And they're like, sorry, we're going through bankruptcy. And so he was afraid that he might lose his business. And so I am now in this horrific middle position where it's like, I have been wanting to call him for the last two weeks and be like, Hey bro, <laughs> I know your business is, you know, about to fail, but what about my hat mask clip and hot sauce idea? <laughs> but I, I, I just wish like, I don't want to bother him. I There's know no he has sensitive bigger, way of doing that. <laughs> right. He has more important things to do. But I want him to tell me like, hey, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You got to handle it on your own because I have to manage my business. And I'd go, fine, I understand. And I would do it. But the last time we spoke and he told me all this, he's like, Lee, I gave you my word. Like, I'm going to help you with this. So just give me a few more days and then I'm going to get this product made for you. But that was like three or four weeks ago. Yeah. And so it's just, it's just a horrible situation. What is that? Is that you? Uh, I think we, yeah, we have someone at the front door. Uh, it's all good though. I got you. That, that's rough, dude. Cause <clears throat> I'm sure he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to respond back to you and be like, I'm sorry, I can't help you with this anymore, especially after giving you his word and everything. So he's probably just trying to delay this as long as possible. But it's so bad because this is the simplest, like the, the mask idea is so simple and we're not going to be in a pandemic forever. And I wanted it out before Christmas. And this was supposed to be out months ago. And now it's like, I don't need, I don't even know if we're back to the starting point. Yeah. I, I don't even, I don't know. I don't know. And, and so what do you do? You're the relationship guy. What do I do? Pi? <laughs> do I call him? <laughs> My book doesn't handle pandemic productions. <laughs> I know. Pandemic you got to write another runs. chapter about this. I don't know it's, what to do. It's interesting when it comes to pandemics, though, because like, obviously, there are a lot of products that are necessary during that time and specifically during a time like this. And at the same time, it's like you want to be sensitive to all the other things that are going on. I, I don't well, know how to I like to waters. consider my my product is PPE. So I am helping the government. I am helping America. I am helping the world right now. So please don't stand in my way. <laughs> well, this is what I wanted to ask really segue this into, which I think is super interesting. I want to ask you how many business ideas have you started? How, how many of them have taken off versus failed? I probably have half-assed started <laughs> 20 businesses, you know, like, like I talked about it for six months yeah. and then I did one thing and then I never did it again. And then I have to like shamefully tell people that like, like, you know, my hot sauce and hat mask clip idea is going down that path right before our eyes. So, uh, I don't want that. I don't want that to happen anymore, but a lot, I have ideas all the time and a lot of my ideas are so grand that I kind of just pushed them out of my mind, you yeah. know? Well, you, like, uh, there was like the shower curtain iPad idea. Yeah. Which yeah. I, that was one. That was I, one. See, that was a great example. That was one that I talked about for so long and that I was going to do. And I'm like, it's a great idea. And then I'm trying to remember what happened, but I think like by the time I started figuring out who could make it, one hit Amazon. It was, it was already out. Yeah. 
Well, I, I kind of feel like people oftentimes miss the boat on what it is to be an entrepreneur, what it is to start up a business. And I think what they think it is, is thinking of one great idea and going and launching it and making millions of dollars. And in reality, what it looks more like is throwing a bunch of balls at a target until one of them eventually hits it. Absolutely. But it's also, it is a, it's a muscle that you can work out. And as you get stronger, as your entrepreneurship gets stronger, um, there's, there's like a mental strength that comes into it. And, and you realize like, for instance, the book you have, you've probably worked on this book harder than you've worked on anything before. Yeah, for sure. But it will probably, and I don't want to jinx you, but I would imagine it will make far less money than other things that you've worked much less on. It's very possible. I mean, like the, there has to be, yeah, I, I like the way that you're relaying this to a muscle and that you can train it. And yes, that is very much a possibility, but it's a possibility that you accept when you take it on. Right. But, but it's not, I mean, you're saying it's just a possibility. It's not just a possibility. It's statistically almost a positivity. I mean, nobody makes money on books, right? Your book has to become like the best seller in the world for relationships to be successful at all. Every, like there's a lot, there, there's a New York times bestselling author in this neighborhood that I'm friends with. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I never made any money off my New York times book. Yeah. I made money off of what I sold to the people who bought the book afterwards. Nobody makes money on their book. Now I know it is possible to make money on the book, but every author I make is not super rich. You know, maybe yeah. they, they are super rich if they do other things also. But my point is, um, you, you have, practiced for years coming up with a game plan, starting it, finishing it. You're much better at it than me. I get sidetracked like, Oh, it's windy. I'm going to go kiteboarding. And then I, you know, I'm like, I'm not working on the hot sauce anymore or whatever. <laughs> You're much better at it than me. You're much more disciplined. That's part of it. The other part of it is over the years, you have saved up so much money now that you can promote things that you do. Right. So like the average person, if they haven't, if they haven't already been successful in other areas of their life, maybe they write the book, but they don't have any money to promote it. They don't have an audience to push it. Right. 100%. So you, you have built this audience now to where you can make anything. I mean, you're, you're, you're famous within the photography industry, but you're writing a book on relationships, but there's some crossover there. For sure. And that's what, so you, I, I kind of feel like statistics are valuable only when you look at an average contribution, right? Like statistics can only be, so my, my, my point is, yes, the vast majority of books don't make money. And I'm not, I'm not really planning on this book to be like, oh my goodness, we're going to just, it's not going to be life-changing money by any means, but this book is part of a plan which I do expect is going to become a new line of revenue for our business. And one is that this book, Stupid Simple Relationships, is paired with the Stupid Simple podcast. So this podcast, this podcast is our platform for bringing on people, for just building an audience, for building a place where we can kind of have conversations, discuss new ideas. It's kind of my, my place to be able to, uh, uh, you know, research new ideas and new concepts for, for future products. So you were mentioning about like kind of statistics and, uh, and the probability of like a book generating a good amount of revenue. Now I will say this, um, number one, I don't like statistics because statistics, they really only <laughs> apply to like the average level of effort in something like the statistics of a book being successful or not, you're lumping me in with Every author who has never done anything successful and has just written a book on, you know, the best way to clean a garden, which is with a hose. And it's like, okay, like, come on. A hose or a hoe? Both. You got to use a hose <laughs> and a hoe. <laughs> okay. I didn't. 
Uh, I, well, see, I love this. I love this. And and this this is what sets successful people apart from everyone else. Your standard for yourself is so high now that you look at these statistics and you're just like, well, I'm going to do way better than all these people who suck at writing books. And and even if you're wrong, <laughs> I, I, in many cases, I don't think it matters. It I think matter. your comp. Your confidence is enough to make you finish the book. Your confidence is enough to make you promote it. Your confidence is enough for you to create this podcast from nothing and talk about it again and again and again. And even if your book is horrible, so many people will hear about it because of your confidence that they're going to buy it and it's going to be a success. So, you know, who the heck knows? Well, and that's that's the other piece of it was that the the book is part of this plan, right? The the book is Stupid Simple Relationships. The concept is I want to keep designing new frameworks. Like I spent the last decade designing photography frameworks, you know, frameworks for lighting, frameworks for creativity, for shooting, for directing, for posing, for all this kind of stuff. Now I want to create broad audience frameworks. And this podcast is kind of my research platform. Like I get to bring on tons of different guests that are experts in different areas uh, with your own unique sets of experiences. And I get to sit here and gather information for the next Stupid Simple book, which might be Stupid Simple Sales or Stupid Simple Creativity or Stupid Simple Business. Uh, but that's the goal is that it's part of this like overall plan of things that I want to do. Whereas like you lump, you take a statistic of whether or not a book's going to succeed and you're just comparing it to every other person without a plan. And it's the same thing with like, dude, what is the likelihood of creating a website that becomes F stoppers? Come on. I, I, yeah, I agree. It's, it's zero. I guess, I guess my point was instead of saying, uh, the book, I, I, maybe you're saying, I'm saying that the book won't be a success. I'm saying that even if the book is a success, it won't make a lot of money. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Not because of you, just because of books. Just because of what it is in general. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's like, uh, you took a lot of time even, to rephrase that and you landed maybe like one centimeter away from where you were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that wasn't very good. I've, I've had a lot of tequila now, but, um, I, I I'm saying your book, I'm sure your book is good. I'm sure people will love it. I just know a lot of people who write good books and they sell sure. a lot. Like I said, I know the uh, New York Times bestselling author who lives right down the road from me. And he's like, I didn't make any money on that. So that's all I'm saying. But no, here's a question for you. Aside, I agree with you. Okay. Did you ever, are you self-publishing? Yes. So we plan okay. to self-publish this first book within the company. Um, and then, you know, like, see, the thing is that you and I were experienced in building platforms, Right. This is the craziest thing. So let's talk about the world of publishing for just a second. You are 100% correct. In general, in the world of publishing, people just don't make money, especially off of their first book. Because in most cases, like a great deal in publishing, and I've done research on this, I've also spoken with literary agents, and I've also had people have interest in, in what I'm doing. Now, a great deal when placed in front of you uh, is, let's say, fifty to $100,000 advance. Okay, this is amazing. People generally don't get this kind of stuff to write a book, right? So a publisher is so interested in your book, they're willing to give you $50,000 to finish this book. Along with that, you essentially sell the book to the publisher and you basically will earn like a 10 to maybe 15% royalty on this book. And if there are people that are in this industry, you guys can always help clarify everywhere that I'm wrong, which I'm sure you will. Uh, but this is from my limited knowledge of it. So they expect you to market your book the same. If you're going to launch a podcast, great. They expect you to do that too. If you're going to, you know, you should be going around and be doing book signings. You should be going around. You should be promoting. You should be doing YouTube. You should be doing all these different things. They expect you to market your book as if you got 100% of the royalty, but you're only getting 15%. Now, the publisher- I honestly have never heard of anyone getting 15%. I've heard eight to twelve percent. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, fifteen percent was on like the high side, right? I think most people probably yeah. land around ten. Um, so for a good book, you'd probably land around ten. Then, so you you sell them the rights. Now, if if you have the next Twilight series, then your publisher, or let's say you got Harry Potter on your hands, like the publisher is going to get so excited about that because 
it's Harry Potter. So they're going to leverage all of their marketing assets, all their people, all their money, all their teams to push Harry Potter. Why? Because it sells the most out of all the books in their entire library. Meanwhile, the rest of the books in this library are essentially shelved because one series is doing so well that it's essentially 80, 90% of their overall revenue. So this is the unfortunate side of the publishing industry where it's like, if I'm going to be expected to do all of that work and I'm going to be expected to sign away the rights to my book and I'm only going to be getting 10%, why, why, why do it for 10%? Why do it on the hope and the chance that this publisher is going to love my book and push my book the same way that I would. Now, if I were a person that have never built a platform before, then I still think that the publisher has an argument there because you haven't done this before, but you and I have. So why? Why, why do anything but self-publish? I agree. It seems like such a scam to me. It's so crazy. I, t- I mean, 10%. <laughs> I mean, think about this in any other industry in the world. Like, yeah. okay, you do all the work completely on your own time by yourself, potentially for years. Like you've been working on this for years. We will take 90% just to send it to print. Yeah. And it will be on some shelves for some amount of time, maybe not very long, but it, it, like you might see it in Barnes and Noble for a little while for they, 90%. They would have to sell beyond, they'd have to sell 10 times as many books just for you to make the same amount of money, 10 times as many books. Yeah. It's which, crazy. which again, if they believe in your book, if, if, if you have this lotto ticket, you know, you got Harry Potter and they just back it. Then I do believe that a publisher with all their connections could get this book out to the entire world significantly better than I could as a, I just, I wonder what, uh, what's, what's her name? Rollings or whatever, JK, Rollins. what her cut is. D- does she get 10%? Does she get 20%? What do you think she gets? Oh, at this point, I'm sure it, it's, it's very significant. I would think after her first major hit, if you have a major hit, like a, a Harry Potter, I would imagine that the rest of the deals at that point become very much more favorable. But I, but your, I'm just I'm curious. I mean, I bet it's not more than fifty percent. I bet I bet the publisher's still making more. And maybe you could argue, out of that hundred percent pie, they are they are including the cost of printing and shipping and right. I mean, it, they are including it's, all it, that. It, yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not like they're taking ninety percent of the profit. But still, it's crazy. I mean, if they're actually going to work to publish, if they're actually going to work to put this thing on shelves, if they're going to market, if they're going to do all those things, I genuinely feel like a publishing company that's going to do all those things should get 60% of your book sale. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing all the distribution, all the marketing, all the printing, all the hard costs, everything like that. They should get the majority of the book and, and you'd still be doing incredibly well with 30 to 40%. Uh, so that to me seems completely fair. What doesn't seem fair is eight to 12%. Like that, that, that kind of blows me away. And to have to like, kind of, you know, it's, it's this lotto ticket of this one in a thousand shot that the publisher that signs me actually believes in the book versus just shelving the rights to it until they have the time to help market it. And in the meantime, you're doing all your marketing, you're doing your podcast, you're doing your promotion and you're getting 10%. It's it's crazy. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited you're doing it by yourself, and I'm excited to hear how it goes. When when is this thing coming out? I've been hearing about it forever. I've been talking about it forever. So um, mm-hmm. January we plan to launch the podcast. Uh, you guys are going to be part of the initial episodes, and then uh, I think we're going to do Q1 of 2021 for the book launch. Is so. it done? <laughs> this is funny. Like. When you get your book done, I want you to, I want you to call me when your book is okay. done. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I feel like from the author's perspective, it never feels done. There's always, so right now the book, I, I have a full product. I've had a full product for quite a while. And I think I actually sent you a, a copy of it a little while back. Um, you did. But in rereading it, I felt like a lot of the language and a lot of my personality was lost in the editing process. So in addition to adding that back in, I also want to see if I can take, uh, just cut the book by 15%. Like if I can just take what it is now and take, you know, 10,000 words off of it, 
I feel like it'd be stronger. So I'm going to actually do a, a, another read, another pass where I'm just going to eliminate extra. You are out of your damn mind, man. I don't understand. I mean, I respect it. I respect it. I look up to you. I always think to myself, I should be more like pie. I need to work harder. But I'm like, why? Just put it out. You know what people do? They do the, uh, what's it called? Where they do the updated version of the book. Yeah. If you don't have, you know, a thousand copies in print, that's easier. <laughs> well, if you're, what do you mean a thousand copies in print? I mean, so I'm, we're going to be releasing this as an ebook as well as in print, right? So once you've moved your first thousand copies of print, then yeah, you can do a second edition or whatever, but yeah. Second edition. There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. A thousand, a thousand. That's not that many. Like you'll like get through that. See if you can sell the thousand. And then if you sell the thousand, then you're like, all right, maybe I should reread this and uh, tone it up a little bit. Hey, you but if you don't to reread your book, <laughs> if you, uh, my, but, but okay, well then that's, that, you know, makes my point even better. If you start selling it and people are like, this is the greatest book since Harry Potter, then <laughs> And then you'd be like, oh, thank God I didn't waste any more time rewriting it. It's genius on a page right now. It's almost as if Kanye wrote it himself. <laughs> and we have come full circle. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> have you have you read any of the book? I'm curious. So I started reading it and I'm a bad friend because I didn't continue. <laughs> but my excuse is that you gave me like a like a Microsoft Word document or something. Yeah. And I read very little, first of all, but I, what digital books I do read, I read on my iPad and each time I would open it, it would go back to the top of the word doc. So and I'm I, like, I, I lost my place every time. And I was like, I got to wait until I, and I believe it or not, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to convert a word doc or text into the, is it called books app? Uh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Dude, I download like five programs to try to do it. I could not figure it out. And then I just thought, I'm just going to wait until Pi does this. Just wait. Just wait for it. I'll get, you, uh, I'll get you a printed copy. Can I ask you what your book is going to be about? So, I mean, uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about here, I just, I feel like a lot of people have every, I won't say a lot of people, I was going to say everybody is creative. Everybody has ideas, but the majority of people do nothing. They yeah. do nothing. And, and the only reason they accomplish what they do is because they have to, to pay the bills. Right. Yeah. And then they usually end up buying things they can't afford. They buy an apartment or rent an apartment. It's a little too nice. They get the car with the payment. That's a little too high. And it's like, Oh, I gotta, like, I gotta yeah. work harder to pay for these things, but they're not really accomplishing. What's that? You get stuck in this feedback loop. Yeah, exactly. But, but they're just working to pay for bills rather than actually producing and creating things that they want to create for fulfillment or for real money or for whatever it might be. And so I wanted to write this book. That's kind of just, I'm not going to say like anything in the book is groundbreaking at all, but it's just kind of like my thought process on starting businesses, making money, from what I have learned doing it myself, but also meeting people like you and especially the people that I've met down here in Puerto Rico. I mean, I've met the most eccentric group of people who do the weirdest things for money imaginable. You yeah. would hear these, you would hear these things. If somebody came to you and pitched you these ideas of these guys that were making millions of dollars, you'd be like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. But they're already doing it and they are multimillionaires from it. And so it just kind of goes to show, like you were saying earlier, that it's not about having this brilliant idea. In many cases, it's just about doing anything and then repeating it again and again and again and again. For sure. But most people do nothing. They just work because they have to. And then they watch TV and then they go to work the next day and they just keep doing it and doing it. And uh, and so my book was going to be kind of like a business, self-help and, and so much more. And my idea for the way that I was going to write this, because I have 
first of all, I have no ability to, to, you know, write a full normal book, but I also wouldn't want to read one either. I was going to write, like have chapters. And then each chapter would be like a chapter on, uh, your social interactions with other people, money. Oh, we lost him again. Ah, you're here. You're here. Oh, I oh see you. Goodness. I was about to write we, down what like you just I said. A, I, I saw it. I had a power it. surge. I but saw then I it. Came back. It looked like a flicker. Yeah. Sorry. Um. So each chapter is going to be these headers, but then within each chapter, I'm going to do all these sub chapters that are very short. They're more than a paragraph, obviously, but just a couple of pages on individual topics that all might have to do with money. So maybe there's 10 or 15 sub chapters on saving money. Yeah. But different aspects of saving money. And then I can use these sub chapters as blog posts around the internet as promotion, or I could use these sub chapters as like a subject for a YouTube video or something. Well, that was my idea years ago. You need to write this book, dude. Like I, I, I want to, so everybody that's, that's listening, they, they're not going to know. You're always a super humble person, dude. Like you, you don't talk yourself up. And, and now that I've used the terms genius, uh, you're probably going to be offended when I say that I feel like you have quite a bit of genius as well. Now, now it's like, now it's <laughs> like I'm describing and something Spears. else. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> you're, you're right up there with Kanye and Trump, bro. <laughs> you're doing good. Yeah. No, um, I, there, there's a lot of things that I've looked up to you in terms of, in, in, in terms of business for, and I think you have such a valuable voice to contribute to this overall conversation. I would read this book. I would bring you back on multiple times just to discuss the ideas in this book. You need to finish it. But I know one of the things that I was thinking of was you have this kind of no bullshit approach to business um, that I really have learned uh, uh, quite a bit from. Like when I approach you with an idea, you don't get s s like kind of lost in the dream of it. You kind of just really evaluate it from like a a very I shoot it down. The word you're looking for is shoot it down. I, yeah, you, you're you're just an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you take these ideas and, um, and you have a really great way of looking at concepts from the way a typical audience would. And I would say that like more so than any person that I've met, you know, what video is going to do in, in general, you know, what types of videos are going to do well. I disagree, but continue. <laughs> you have to, you guys are I putting don't. out you guys are, don't. one after another, you guys put out great videos. And like, look at granted, our YouTube count, man. Like, it's not great. I don't know, dude. Nobody's going to be able to ever guess what's going to go viral and what's not. I mean, at least you're not going to be right 100% of the time. But in general, the content that you guys are making is fantastic. What you guys have done, the way that you guys have been able to distill each of these photographers who are not educators, you've taken professional photographers and you've distilled what they do down to something that typical consumers want in a way that's been more successful than any other platform that I know. The, the, those are very unique things. And okay. You're just going to, yeah, go I mean, we, your... no, no, like I, I agree that, that like some of the tutorials we have, we have pried information out of these photographers who are not good at teaching. I yes. agree. We've done a good job with that. But in terms of like our YouTube content and stuff, we are struggling for sure. We, we always think like, this is going to be a great one. And then in, not successful at all, but go ahead. Okay. So, so that piece aside, um, you have a very unique way of filtering content that I think would make for an incredible book. Like I want to hear your perspective on this because while you have engaged, you have engaged in several different activities. Uh, but the, the biggest ones that you have, you have F stoppers. That was a huge hit. You had the light disc, which was a significant hit. You've had each of the flash disc, flash disc. Flash disc. And let me just say to everyone watching at home, I was actually just talking about you the other day, Pi. I think I was I was telling uh, Isaac, you 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 met Isaac down here in Puerto Rico, right? Yeah. Another jujitsu buddy. I was telling him, he was like, "How did you create your first product?" And I was like, "It was one hundred percent Pi that made our product for us." And I think you were just at the time 
trying to do us a very simple favor because you speak Cantonese or whatever, and you you had manufacturing connections in China, and you thought like, oh, it's such a simple product, I can probably do this in just a few hours, and then it ended up taking like months. And I know I've thanked you before, but like I definitely owe you a big one for that because you went so far above and beyond to no, to make that. And Isaac was like, why would your competitor do that for you? And I'm like, I agree, but we're friends I first. I, guess. I mean, that's how we've always been. We've always been friends first. And and honestly, like you guys have helped us out a ton too, um, in, in many different ways. And we've, we've had so many, I, I do feel like at one point we are going to go into business together with something. Like I, I do feel something, like we're going to do something. Um, yeah. but my point is, is that you have such a unique way of looking at these things. And meanwhile, while you've created all these successful hits, all these different products, you've enjoyed life, dude. Like that is probably the biggest thing that I've learned from you is to just keep like enjoying life. Don't stop doing the things that you enjoy doing. And almost, I would say on your side, you probably prioritize those things. You're kiteboarding, you prioritize everything in front of work, which I think is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, I will, I will accept that critique of myself. Um, I do. And I, I go back and forth all the time between thinking like, I've really got, I've got things figured out. Like I'm, I'm working just the right amount to then, you know, you'll see, I'll, I'll see somebody like you. It's usually my friends, you know, I'll see somebody like you or Mike Kelly posting just some awesome project that you're working on. And here I am like playing video games or going kiteboarding or like skateboarding around. And I'm like, Yes, I don't need to stop doing these things, but I should be I should probably be a little bit more intentional about really figuring out what I like to do and yeah. continuing to do that just as much. But there's still a lot of like I'm not a big uh, I don't I don't really watch TV, but I do waste a lot of time watching YouTube videos, right? Mm-hmm. So I can just sit and watch YouTube videos all day cuz there's endless stuff and whatever I'm interested in, whatever I think of, I can just find. And st- an aspect of that I appreciate, and I think it's making me a better person, but the majority of it is just wasting my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think you're the one that's kind of taught me that like, I don't need to utilize every possible second for every single thing. I mean, I would say between but, you and Justin, you guys have been the the two people that have kind of like given me perspective on those kind of things. And that's see, also I feel like Justin was a super overachiever. Is he not that? He I would say is very balanced. So like he works hard. He he does a really good job of compartmentalizing. So when he's at work, he's like legit at work. Don't bug me. I'm working. And then hmm. when he leaves, he's like a hundred percent with the family, a hundred percent, you know, into his workout, a hundred percent into the activities. It's very, for someone who has ADHD, watching what he does is almost like magic uh, because he can just, that sounds like magic to me. Uh, it's very, it's, is, uh, you know, it's super impressive. A- anyone like that, you know, you look at these people, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I was going to say Elon Musk, like, yeah, Justin's just like, Elon Musk, just as smart, just, a uh, but even Elon Musk, like Elon Musk doesn't, isn't able to control the like physical side of his life. You know, like Justin has the physique of a Greek God, like he, every aspect of his life is excellent. Whereas like even, even Trump, he's got that mom, but like even Trump can't handle, you know, putting down the KFC. So it's cool when somebody is really able to excel on every little aspect of their life. That's it's cool. He he has good balance. And I think there are areas where, you know, like in terms of there are areas that each of us have our strengths. Right. But in terms of balance, I would say uh, I haven't really seen anyone do it better than him as well as yourself. And and the perspective that you have. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Like, no, you can't. No, you can't. You can't. I, I don't have the balance that he has. I like, feel like I am, you do. I am like 95% play. And then like now that Mike's here, I'm, I am, I am being serious and I'm probably being annoying to Mike where every time I like Mike wants to hang out and I'm like, Hey man, you need to be filming right now. We can't be hanging out and talking. Let's film. Then we play, let's film. Then we play. But the majority of my life, I'm like, 
there's nothing else to do. I guess I should get some work done. Okay. So that even more so why you need to write a book because that's almost aggravating for somebody who does work as hard as anybody else. Might. Like I work a lot and I, and granted I have a yeah, lot more balance these days, but I, I used to work insane amounts and to see that you have been more effective in the businesses that you've created, despite working dramatically less, a person like you needs to put that into a book. I know. I just have to open it. And it's so hard to do that. So, so look, here's what you're going to do. You're going to promise on this podcast, number okay. one, that you're going to send me what you have right now so we can start talking about it. I don't want, I don't want to send it to you yet because I want, <laughs> I want it. I don't, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent done, but I want it to be 90% done before I send it to you. And then I want an honest critique. So if you're like, Lee, this is this is unreleasable. I, I want that from you. And, but if I send it to you now, it's just like a, it's just fluff. Like you'll, you won't even know what you're looking at. Are you sure? You said you had like a hundred pages of this thing. I don't know. I can't, it can't be a hundred okay. pages. I can't write a hundred pages. Commit to a date of when I get a rough edit. When, when do I get a rough book in my hand? A rough draft. This is good. Manager. This is good. I am glad. I am glad you are holding my feet to the fire right now. I, will give you, when is this podcast coming out? This is probably going to be out sometime in January. I. It's November 24th right now. (laughs) Send you a rough draft January. I'm sorry, February 7th. Okay. And your baby's coming. My baby is due February 22nd. Okay. All right. February 7th. So oh, I'm going to expect a I've rough draft. Now I have to do something. You have to do something now. And here's the thing is that like, uh, yeah, I, I honestly feel like, like uh, the book process for me has been more about just one hour a day than these long chunks of, of time. Yeah. These long chunks of time yeah. just don't happen. And the thing that happens for me is that if I don't do one hour a day, if I do it eight hours on a Saturday, it's not effective because when I get to the next Saturday, I've forgotten all the things that I'd written before. And when you start getting up to like 200 plus pages, it's really hard to keep things straight when you're not doing it each day. So that is really good advice. February 7th, I'm going to have a rough yeah. draft. Now tell me, oh, brother. God. You're prepping. I'm writing this down, by the way, February. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. This is good. I need to do this. I need to do this. We should also do some sort of weight loss challenge because I started dieting a month or two ago. And uh, like always, it just kind of fell off and the titties are coming back. And uh, I feel like I feel like if if I'm about to go back, here's, a, here's what I'm worried about. I'm about to go back to Charleston in winter. I'm down here in Puerto Rico right now. It's winter, but it's 85 degrees every day. So mm-hmm. I still do everything athletic that I know. Like tomorrow we're going on the boat and I'm going to go snorkeling and swimming. Um, but in Charleston, it's too cold to do anything. And the only thing to do in Charleston is jujitsu, but it seems a little dangerous, dangerous to do it right before my baby is born Yeah, don't when do the now. pandemic will be at an all-time high. I, I think so it's a good idea. I'm, like with... That was one thing with Yen being pregnant. Um, my biggest caution was just not introducing complications to the pregnancy. If I, I yeah. think if Katie gets anything, like even the flu is not a good thing to get when you're, you know, when you. Well, here's pregnant. what I was thinking too. I keep, you know, this probably isn't true, but Katie never gets sick. She's just the type of person that I, I get sick all the time and she'll never catch it from me. And so when you hear stories about people, it's always the husband that gets it. And then the wife is always fine or she's got it, but she's asymptomatic, whatever. I know that will happen to Katie. But what I'm worried about is that I could get it. And then because I have it, even if I feel okay, I would miss the birth of my child. Oh, that's very possible. Because they won't let me in the hospital. Yeah. There, there's really strict rules right now on that. So that's very possible. Um, yeah. I would definitely recommend being very safe and cautious until, you know, I mean, just in general, but of course, when, what about early born. January? Can I do jujitsu then? I have been, so I haven't been doing any jujitsu. What I've been doing is biking. So I bike probably 50 to hundred miles a week. Um, that's the way I've been keeping up my cardio. And then I do hit training in the mornings. 
I got to get my, I, I'm with you. How do you I gotta, do, like you do hit training by yourself? Yeah. So in my gym, I've built out a little bit of a, a hit training gym and, and, or sorry, in my, in my garage. Um, uh, okay. So every morning I'll wake up, take baby downstairs, feed her. Um, and then she goes, baby goes with me to the garage. She's super chill. And uh, I'll do 45 minutes of hit. Yen will come down, start doing her workout and I'll take off on my bike. Um, that's kind of been my only sanity keeper during this thing is just getting in my, my workouts. What, what I haven't been doing is eating properly. So I've been gaining weight just cause I'm pounding garbage, dude. And that, yeah. that's where I need to, I, so I need some accountability on that side. So if you want to do nutrition, I'm going to write that down too. <laughs> I got, I got a good quarantine 15 to lose. Um, tell me something, brother. What does it feel like having your first baby? Um, I don't know. It still doesn't really feel real. I'm sure, you know, it won't be real till I'm looking at it in the eye, but I can finally feel like her stomach and I can feel that thing kicking around in there. So it's, it's wild to me. It's, and Katie has always been afraid of having kids. And she's always said things like, ew, like I don't want some human growing inside of me. That's disgusting. And then to watch it happen to her and now it's just normal to her. Yeah. Like I would think this is amazing. Like, oh my gosh, there's a human being swimming inside me and kicking around and I can feel it. And we, with the sonogram, we can see its face. That's amazing. But already to her, I mean, she, part of her thinks it's amazing, but another part of her is just like, ah, quit kicking me. Like I gotta get back to making breakfast or, you know, it's just, life and and it's really wild it's hard for me to comprehend i i think when baby's born it's it's gonna very much change for her like when there's yeah it, it's a trippy process man and and yen was um yen helped me like to very much feel attached to baby you know because I, I feel like the guys kind of get left out of the process a lot um we don't know what's going on inside mom's belly, but Yen was always like grab my hand and kind of, you know, putting it over the belly when baby was kicking and all this kind of stuff. So I kind of felt connected, uh, throughout the entire process. Um, and then when this is our fourth now, so when, uh, well, we have three children, two are from my other marriage. Um, and she had one, but this is together our fourth child. And and when baby was born, it was, it was amazing. And it was also very different this go around, um, than everything else. And maybe we could talk about that some other point, but I'm excited to, we have this kind of pre birth chat and getting your kind of thoughts and stuff. And I can't wait to, after baby comes to get you back on and see how life has changed. (laughs) Everybody's like sleep. now. your life's about to be over, man. And that's another thing. I'm like, if I can't get my ass in gear to write this book now where I have 100% free time, how am I going to do it when there's a crying baby? I have to do it now. So I'm glad you're forcing me to do it. I got to open it. I got to open that word doc. You're going to get it done. But the other thing too, is I think, I think baby's going to make you more focused and more driven. So someone in this neighborhood was recently telling me that he was like, I was always a hard worker, but when I had my first kid, I became an animal. Yeah. I like all I could think about was I have to provide for this family. And in a way he he said he neglected his family. Yeah. It's because very he had this that. new urge to provide for them, which obviously I don't want to do that. But uh yeah, maybe maybe it'll naturally kick my ass in gear even more. It'll be super interesting to see, man. Can't wait to have you back to uh chat about it. But I appreciate you taking the time. I know today uh Mike had to go and work on production. So you kind of stepped in and I was going to have you on anyway, but you stepped in into his slot. So I appreciate that. But, uh, well, I appreciate you allowing it so that I could crack the whip on Mike and keep him continuing to work down there. <laughs> I can't wait to hear from Mike after all this. He's going to be like, man, the and Patrick, they used to be so much fun, but they put me to work this time. <laughs> hey, we're taking him on a big ass boat tomorrow to an Island. So he has nothing to complain about. That should be a lot of fun, dude. Well, it's always great chatting with you, dude. I can't wait to uh, do it again. In the meantime, um, you guys have 
Well, if, if people want to learn about what you guys do, definitely head over to fstoppers.com. Um, this is probably going to be released after your Black Friday sales and all that kind of stuff is over. But you guys make some of the most incredible education out there. So for those creative professionals that are in the realm of photography, cinematography, I would highly recommend jumping onto the fstoppers store as well as following you guys on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So for the most part, fstoppers.com, we've got a ton of writers, uh, free content every day. fstoppers.com slash store is the paid tutorial content. And then, uh, fstoppers YouTube channel is the, uh, is mostly just me and Patrick making content, photography related, video related for the most part. And then we also started a uh, F-Stoppers Live YouTube account due to the pandemic uh, where we started this thing called the Coronavirus Journal. And I hate to say it, I surely thought we would be done with this journal by now. But uh, in January, when this podcast comes out, I guess I'll be in Charleston, you know, writing the book, first of all. But uh, maybe I won't be with Patrick to make it. But we we do these live updates of everything in the world that's going on with the coronavirus. It's absolutely not photography related at all. And we don't get many views on it. We only get like 15,000 views per video. Um, but we have a, a dedicated group of <laughs> followers who love watching us update the world on the virus and like what's going on and stuff. So if you're interested in that, interested in that check that out too. That's very much a cool cult following. And uh, I can't wait to, I, I hope you call me, dude, during this whole book writing process. So call me anytime and can't wait to have you back on the podcast. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, man. See ya. See ya.